Welcome to the seminar about the Trinity. My name is Jiri Moskala and I am professor of Old Testament exegesis and theology. And my task is to have with you a beautiful, good, meaningful time about this concept of the Trinity in the Old Testament. My lecture is entitled Toward Trinitarian Thinking in the Old Testament. Let me tell you that whatever um, I will say, and more of it is uh, in uh, the website. You can download the whole article on the same topic, Toward Trinitarian Thinking in the Hebrew Scriptures, which was published in Journal of Adventist Theological Society in the year 2010. And you can go to the website of www.atsjats.org. And there you can, uh, you know, download it from the archives of the Journal of the Adventist Theological Society. Um, under my name, you will find this article. Therefore, this is very simple. So I will go a little bit faster you know, through my material here. If you want some more additional details or um, stop somewhere, you can um, have it in more details in that article. And because we will study the Word of God, I would like to start with prayer. Because I strongly believe that we need the guidance of the Holy Spirit when we open the Scriptures, that He can lead us into His truth. Our Heavenly Father, we come to You in the name of Jesus. And we want to thank You for this great opportunity to study Your Word. And we are totally dependent on Your revelation. Therefore, open our mind and touch our hearts that when we will study your scriptures, we will be able to understand. And uh, not only understand, but also to live accordingly and to use all this knowledge to your glory. Therefore, bless us, and I thank you for your presence. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, then, uh, our topic is what can be found about the Trinity in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures. The word Trinity cannot be found in the Old Testament. At the same time, I would like to say, say that there are clear glimpses, some hints about God's plurality in the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, it is stated, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may follow all the words of this law. Therefore, things which are revealed to us, we can study. We know God because He made Himself known to us. And I think this is very important observation. God revealed Himself to us through His Scriptures. We are totally dependent on His revelation on the Bible. And God's majesty and power can be seen in scriptures, but something, some glimpses of it, can be also seen in the nature. But in the Bible we have more, because we have the written word of God, not only revealed in general way in the nature. And the existence of God is assumed in the Bible, not proven, but uh, we go from that axiom on. And we can see that uh, in the Bible, God is presented. And this is a majestic God. And more we know about God, more we are standing in awe before Him. And this is why we are not able to comprehend everything. We can only something understand about God. But this something about God, what we know, it's such a beautiful revelation that we can really admire our God. And we know we can go that he is a very beautiful God, good God, and we want to, to follow him. There is uh, probably like um, a legend, I don't know if it is true or not, but it is uh, said that uh, Augustine one day was um, walking along uh, the seashore, and there um, uh, he saw a small boy playing there. And a small boy was playing uh, with the seawater, and uh, he had a hole in, in the um, sand. 
And Augustine asked him, well, what are you doing? And the small boy said, well, I am trying to pour all the ocean into my hole. Well, this is what we are sometimes trying to do. Put an infinite God into a small brain of ours that we would like to <laughs> comprehend everything. It's impossible. Before God, we are like small children. And we are totally dependent on his, um, on his revelation. And we are using a human language for um, description of the infinite God. Already this fact tells us that we cannot comprehend completely. You know, there are some people who would like to put an infinite God into the box of their own thinking. Our God is a transcendent God who surpasses all our categories, even the best of our categories. We need to know our limits. And um, as I said, we are using a limited human language to describe an infinite God. And this is an impossible task. It's only possible because God revealed something to us. And what he revealed, we would like to study together. And because it's such a, a great task, I think that the um, proper attitude um, when we study about God, and by the way, this is the best topic ever because when we speak about God, this is really wonderful. Therefore, we need to understand that we need to have this humble attitude, that we cannot know everything. We have a limited understanding. But we need at the same time stay with his revelation and not try to find all the logic in it. We need to bow down humbly before God's revelation and, of course, before God himself. I think that experience of Moses uh, described in Exodus 3.5 is a model in which we should uh, do. Take off your sandals, God said to Moses, for the place where, I am, where you are standing is holy ground. Yes, when we speak about God and we want to understand him, we are really on the holy ground. And uh, yes, um, we want to study the scriptures, what we have there. And the first statement I would like really uh, to ponder upon is that statement found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, where we have the Shema, which is... Um, this beautiful statement, Shema Israel, Adonai Elohenu, Adonai Echad, which means, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, is Echad. And of course, this is a statement about um, monotheism. It's a statement on monotheism in the polytheistic society. Israelites were not henotheists, it means that they were believing in many gods, and above these many gods was the true God of Israel, true living God. No, they were believing in one God, and this God is a living God. And this is God of Israel, God of Jesus, God of prof prophets, God of apostles, God um, of um, all of us. For we, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we believe in one God, manifested in three different persons, but one God in three persons. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God in three persons. Well, uh, some people say it's illogical. Well, it's true. When you take uh, one plus one plus one, even mathematically, you cannot say it's one because mathematically you say it's three. But still, we maintain that in that super logic of faith, we can have one plus one plus one equals one. Well, we can say differently even mathematically, like uh, one times one times one equals one. And this is mathematically correct. And if we can do it mathematically, much, how well, much more God can surpass all our mathematical formulas. You can have like one squared on the third power. 
and you can play with that. But God surpasses all mathematical categories. You cannot put God into the graph or into the mathematical formula. Uh, he is above all of this. Even our logic is very limited. Our brain, our thinking is limited. For we need to be open to more of it. Something similar is um, in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, where it stated that um, husband and wife, these two persons, will be a hut. This is the, the same word. They will be one. Therefore, here you have that two persons are one. One times one equals one. Or um, we can say that two persons are forming one marriage. And in the similar way, but much more than uh, we can even imagine and explain, is that God is uh, one and in three persons. For, let's see what we can have in the Bible, like the biblical testimony about uh, our God. Does this Old Testament statement on monotheism, this Shema, allow for the Trinity, or is it excluded by definition? The New Testament confirms the monotheistic belief that God is one. And you can uh, see all these places in the New Testament from Mark, you know, 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, Titus, James. Uh, the New Testament authors did not see this proclamation as a contradiction to the Trinitarian thinking because we have this Trinitarian thinking very plainly um, expressed in the New Testament. Um, like in Matthew 28:19, or in 1 Corinthians 13:14, and so forth. Well, let me uh, tell you that um, when I was like 14, 15 years old, I met some uh, members of the of Jehovah's Witness, um, you know, congregation, and they invited me that they would like to speak with me about Trinity. I thought that I know the Bible. Um, I was quite confident. I said, yes, let's go and let's discuss the Trinity. And then we were debating like for three, maybe even four hours. And after that, I felt very miserable. I felt like a beaten dog because all my arguments, they were refuting. And when I explained something, they jumped to another text. And when we went through that, they jumped to another. And it was like going in circles and I uh, said after that, well, I need to study that issue much more and better. And therefore, this was a very good lesson for me, that I thought I need to study the scriptures in a better way. And something from these studies, but now for long years already, I would like to share with you in uh, this lecture. Uh, there are many texts in the New Testament about the Trinity. I have only, you know, the list here, and I will not go through it. And we can have about many texts about the divinity of Jesus, because, of course, if we speak about the Trinity, we need to be quite sure that Jesus Christ is divine, He's God. And then also about the Holy Spirit, on the divinity of the Holy Spirit. One of the best texts is in Acts chapter 5, uh, 3 to 9, when um, lying against God is equal to um, with lying against the Holy Spirit. Therefore, Holy Spirit and God is exactly, uh, you know, the, the same uh, entity. It means it's, it's uh, God. It's a part of the Godhead. And here, uh, you know, in my study here, I would like now to limit uh, the study to the Old Testament only. I will limit it to um, uh, the scriptures of Jesus Christ and the apostles, because this was the Bible of Jesus, Old Testament, Bible of the apostles. And um, we would wrestle now um, how, uh, you know, Jesus, how apostles like Apostolic Church were, um, were expressing uh, well, for, from where they were taking this idea in order to express things about uh, this Trinitarian thinking. Therefore, the question is, is there room for the Trinitarian thinking in the Old Testament, or is it categorically 
excluded. Arguments in favor of the Trinity of the Old Testament, um, I would say there are many from different angles. Um, and we have uh, different hints, glimpses, or allusions, traces, um, footprints, or even some explicit statements for the doctrine of the Trinity in the Old Testament. And I would like to show you a few of them. Therefore, let's do it in more in a systematic way. There are some people who would like to say that the term Elohim, term for God, um, is um, already an allusion to the Trinity. Well, here we need to be more careful. There are different titles, designations, or names for our living God, like Yahweh, El Shaddai, Adonai, and um, Elohim is part of, of uh, these titles. But Elohim, it's true, it's grammatically speaking a, a plural form, but um, we cannot say that because it's in the plural form, therefore it's an indication for the Trinity. The word Elohim is a plural form from El or um, uh, Eloah. And is it an argument in favor of Trinity? And I have to say here, no, it is not. Unfortunately, no. Why not? Well, for a simple reason, the term Elohim is used in the Hebrew Bible for a designation of a true God, but also for pagan gods, false gods. Like in Ruth, chapter 1, 15 to 16. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and to her Elohim, to her gods. And uh, go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your Elohim... Your God, living God, will be my Elohim. You see, in that same passage, you have the word Elohim used for pagan gods and then for the true God. Only context decides uh, what is the meaning of the term Elohim. Yes, uh, we have it also in some other places um, in the Old Testament. It is significant that uh, the name Elohim is mainly used with a verb in the singular. If it is really referring to the one true living God, then the verb with that title of God, with that name, is the noun, will be, this verb will be used in the singular, which is a grammatical contradiction, and thus is an indication for the true living God. For example, in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God, grammatically plural, created, which is grammatically singular, the heavens and the earth. Therefore, it's really God, one God who created. Or ten times in uh, the first creation story, you have the statement, and God said, Vayomer Elohim, and God said, God, again plural, in grammatical form, and said, it's singular. This God is saying um, these particular things which are expressed in the first creation story. Well, something similar is with the, uh, another title for God, Adonai, uh, like in Psalm 16, verse 2. Adonai is, we translate, the Lord, the true living God. And it is used for the living God in the singular, the Lord. But grammatically, if we would speak about that, it is a plural form. It will be like my lords. And maybe this is also some kind of reminiscent of the original knowledge. But um, this is um, what we have a little bit in the grammar. But this is not yet proof for the Trinity. Well, uh, what about the five divine plural expressions of us. We have four passages in the Hebrew Scriptures which speak about God in the formula of we. Usually God speaks about himself in the form I, 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 powerful, you know, anochi or ani. But uh, there are these five expressions where God actually speaks about himself 
in the formula of we. And this is uh, different now. And I think this is a um, first very strong indication, uh, hints for the plurality in the Godhead. Like in Genesis 1.26, this is the first uh, uh, passage which we have there. God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Let us and uh, to our image and to our likeness. Therefore, this is the first. The second is uh, Genesis 3.22. The Lord God said, the man has now become, or better to translate, was like one of us. One of us, knowing good and evil. Then we have Genesis 11.7. Let us go down and confuse their language. You have uh, two uh, formula. Let us go down and let us confuse their language so they will not understand each other. Then you have Isaiah 6, 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Again, this divine we. Three times stated this um, formula in cohortative forms and twice with prepositions. You know, let us make, let us go down, let us confuse, of us, for us. For what is their meaning? Uh, are they an indication for monotheism, one God? Or polytheism, many gods, three theism, three gods? Or the Trinity, one God, but three persons? What can we safely say about this biblical text? How to understand them? Well, uh, let me tell you that there are different possibilities how to understand this uh, let us formula, this divine we. First, uh, one way is you can overlook them as uh, if they did not exist. Second, alter them like in the Targum of Isaiah. The we formula is eliminated completely. Or we need to interpret them. Now, how to interpret? There are several theories. Let me... Uh, show you very quickly that there are like seven main interpretive proposals how to understand this we of God. The first is uh, like the, uh, that this um, uh, you know, formula of we of God is a mythological reminiscence, like um, you know, reminiscence of pagan origin. One God is addressing another God or pantheon of gods in planning to create humans. Well, um, uh, without going into details, we can say the Pentateuch, and particularly the book of Genesis, is anti-mythological. There is also no room in Genesis for evolutionary thinking that goes from polytheism you know, um, to monotheism. There is nothing like that. Well, second possibility is to uh, argue that um, this divine plural is a reference to Christ. And, uh, that God, the Father, spoke to Jesus Christ were attested already in the epistle of Barnabas and uh, in uh, Justin Martyr. The first uh, council of Smyrnium in AD 351 not only affirmed that Genesis 1.26 was addressed by the father to the son as a distinct person, but also excommunicated those who deny it. Very, very interesting. Well, but even uh, um, it sounds very good, that this divine plural is that Father speaks to the Son, Jesus Christ, is not uh, really the best interpretation. Why not? The text itself does not state who spoke to whom. And this theory imposes one's own ideas on the biblical text, putting the New Testament understanding into the reading of these expressions. And um, uh, why not, uh, you know, that uh, one uh, person is speaking to two persons? Um, uh, or Jesus uh, is speaking to the Father, or uh, uh, the Holy Spirit speaks to, to both of them, uh, to other, um, you know, person of, of the God. Therefore, this is all beautiful, but uh, it has not uh, uh, the biblical basis for it. Third possibility is um, some, uh, you know, especially Jewish scholars in the past were suggesting uh, that God spoke to the earth. Well, why would the earth be a partner to God in creation? 
when according to Genesis 2, 7, he, God, took the ground of the earth and from it created humans. Therefore, it does not make sense that um, God would speak to the earth. The first possibility is um, very popular interpretation that here is like the plural of majesty. According to this theory, God spoke in a solemn way about himself like a king in a plural form. Uh, this is a quite uh, young interpretation. Uh, you can see uh, names of some scholars here um, on this slide. But it is proposed in correspondence to the medieval speeches of European kings when they spoke uh, about themselves in plural form. Like, um, we, the king of England, or we, king of Russia, or we, are not amused, you know, they were speaking in that plural form. But um, we have to say that uh, this is not attested in the Bible, even though some would like to use the text of Ezra 4.18 for that purpose. But this is uh, not really correct because um, even in the text, the letter you, Rechum, and Shimshai sent us, this us, does not refer only to the king Artaxerxes, but also to his government. Therefore, um, uh, this is um, much um, more than only uh, king, this us. Um, Paul Juan um, correctly observed that we, as a plural of majesty, is never used in the Bible with a verb. There is no evidence that any king of Israel or Judah or any other ancient ruler around Israel spoke in this way. Therefore, in this um, show that uh, this is not the proper and correct interpretation. The fifth proposal is that uh, God addresses his heavenly court, that he speaks to his angels. Therefore, God speaks to his officials in heaven according to um, uh, that um, interpretation and together they are going to act in creating life and humans. It's a very popular, now popular interpretation. Many Christian and also Jewish scholars defend this position and you can see on the ancient names and also modern name of scholars who speaks about this plural of government of God and government of, of Yahweh. But um, in the Hebrew scriptures, one can speak that God is um, approaching, you know, his uh, court, angels and officials, and uh, he can speak to them. But is it really the meaning in this particular text we were citing? It is highly improbable, and I would like to rule it out for um, uh, some reasons. The, the, um, for two main reasons. God is not addressing his heavenly court. Why? Well, first uh, argument is the exegetical syntactical argument. If you can see the parallelism between Genesis 1, 26 and Genesis 1, 27, you see it very clearly. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And then you have uh, the parallel thought in verse 27. So God, again, it's the same. God created man in his own image, like here, let us make man, and in the image of God, in our image, uh, he created. Therefore, we were created solely to the image of God and not to the image of God and his angels. Therefore, it cannot be that they will be um, part, angels, heavenly God will be part of that creation act of God. And second reason is a theological argument. God is the only creator according to the Bible. There is no one in the entire universe who can be designed as co-creator with him. Created beings cannot be co-creators. And the biblical message is unanimous, unequivocal and consistent. God alone created humans in his own image. Well, uh, then uh, there is uh, another possibility. Some scholars were arguing that God spoke to himself. Like um, God is seen as one person, and this one person is speaking to himself. He's addressing himself as we, 
you know, sometimes do by saying, let us see, let's do it. It's um, uh, God's self-exhortation. He is encouraging himself to do something. Therefore, God is contemplating aloud what he is going to do. The plural of self-exhortation, of self-encouragement. And um, again, uh, there are people who would like uh, to use some, some text for it. But in the closer look, you always see that uh, more is involved. Like um, uh, Professor Klein says, very aptly writes, the rarity of parallelism gives us little confidence in the correctness of this view. Our God is not a solitary being who speaks aloud to himself in order to ex exhort himself for his activity. He does not need really that. The plural of God's self-exhortation, according to scholars, is never found in the biblical material. Well then, you have only the last possibility from this main series, and this is that in that we of God, God spoke within the Godhead. He is in dialogue between the different members or different persons of the deity. The term plural of fullness was coined by Derek Kidner in his 1967 Genesis commentary, and many you know, scholars were really following it. And um, I um, like the term that it's like intra-divine communication between uh, these um, members of the deity. Or some are calling it intra-divine deliberation. Well, who is right? Now, from all the theories, I think uh, that uh, by elimination, uh, we really come uh, to the last one. This is on the uh, solid um, you know, exegesis. And um, I would like to summarize that we have this very crucial observation according to this biblical text. God is presented as we and not always only as I. God spoke as we. He is the divine we. Well, how does one understand this plural in that immediate context? When we go back to Genesis 1.26, uh, God the Creator deliberately presents himself as we and not as I when he creates humans. He creates uh, humans to his um, image. And the divine we creates people in his image, which means that this divine we also makes humans as we, as husband and wife not as isolated individuals, but person in relationship to him and to each other. He, God, is we, so he creates also we, uh, husband and wife. God creates humans into a close fellowship and creates them as male and female. And humans created in God's image must also be a plurality, as he is we, and as there is a unity within God himself, so the two human persons, distinct and different, should become intimately one. Thus the whole human being is we and not I, and if they live in that fellowship, they will maintain his or her humanness. And therefore God creates male and female in his image to a mutual relationship, and these two persons become intimately one. Well, therefore, uh, from that I would like to conclude that um, this divine we is actually plural of fellowship. And I would like to use that uh, term, plural of fellowship. On the background of the creation story, I propose that the divine plural is a plural of fellowship, or plural of community within the Godhead. And the other three passages are really uh, confirming that, that we can speak here about this plural of fellowship or community. When we go to Genesis 3.22, uh, where uh, the fall of uh, humanity is described, sin broke the relationship the, um, uh, of humanity, humans with God, uh, the we God, and humanity's we is now broken, the relationship between humans, their we is wrecked, and when the we of humanity is degraded, then God speaks in plural um, and confronts this we of humans. All is ruined. Only the grace of God's we can bring the needed solution 
and healing. This is why we have this divine we again there. If we go to Genesis 11, verse 7, where we have again for the third time this um, uh, um, you know, divine we, you can see in that chiasm here uh, that um, be part and be prime are really in parallelism. In one side, God speaks. Let us reach, uh, humans are speaking, the speech, uh, speech of humans. Let us reach heaven. And um, here you have uh, in verse 6 and 7 the summary um, as a response to God, uh, human speech is a God speech, divine speech. When humans are saying, let us reach heaven, God is using also this divine we and says, let us go down. Therefore, God's let us um, is a direct reaction to the arrogant um, speech and proud attitude of humans let us. When humans rebel and build their we against God, he reveals his we. Humans need to submit under we and live in close fellowship with him and with each other in order to fulfill the meaning of life. Well, if we go back to Isaiah 68, this will be the first passage of this divine we, uh, we can see that for at least two reasons, the divine plural really refers there to God. First reason, the Hebrew parallelism. And this uh, parallelism is very strong. You can see it again. Whom shall I send? And then uh, you have who shall go for us? And um, this um, is very plain. I and us. The Lord speaks and he is identified as the Lord Almighty and the King in the context. And the second reason, God himself and only he commissions Isaiah to go and preach. The prophet is accountable to God and not to God and to the heavenly court. Therefore, there are two very strong reasons which shows that, uh, again, this divine we is for God himself. It is a plurality uh, of, of uh, God in the Godhead. Therefore, I, I summarize this part here that we can speak really about plural of fellowship in this divine we. This uh, divine fellowship is within the deity. It's a plural of community, the we of God, intra-divine communication within the Godhead. Therefore, the us expression does not contradict, but allows for Trinitarian thinking in the Old Testament, even though it does not proclaim the Trinity plainly yet, as it will be in the New Testament. Well, uh, how also to understand this um, echat, this uh, one, uh, one of God? Actually, this is this echad means oneness or unity of God. It's plainly stated in Genesis 2.24 when two persons are one, one in marriage, two distinct persons, husband and wife, are united and therefore they are one. The stress is on the oneness and unity and not on numbers. And this is, uh, I think, very important. Therefore, Echad uh, really refers um, that the Lord is unique, is Echad unique. God is holy, utterly different. Is the other one, and this otherness of God is stressed. One is not so much a numerical value here, this echad, but rather as a description of the quality of relationship within the Godhead. This echad also means that the Lord is exclusive. He only is worthy of our praise. He is above all the sovereign God, therefore exclusive. And thirdly, the Lord is one, it means uh, he is in unity, he is united, he is oneness, the unity in diversity. God is a union rather than aloneness. And uh, this is the basis for, um, you know, constituency of a society. Therefore, Echad, uh, this is what we have in Deuteronomy 6.4, but um, we don't have Yahid. Uh, Yahid is uh, for, the, you know, like numerical one, as uh, you can uh, see it here on this slide, 
um, the meaning of Yahid is like only, only one, lonely, solitary, single, and so forth. For uh, God is one, the text does not speak of singularness, singleness, or solitude of God. It's a one in the sense of uh, oneness or unity, unity of God. And God is also love. And by definition, it implies, implies that God is unselfish. Therefore, he is not self-centered. Therefore, it implies that there should be um, you know, more persons. It implies community. It implies fellowship. God is love. Not living for one self, but for, for others. Therefore, you know, we have um, clear hints already here uh, for plurality of God in the Old Testament. And the first hint, very plain hints, is that God speaks of himself as we or in the formula of, uh, of us. Within the divine being, there is a distinction of persons and it points to a plurality within the Godhead. Second uh, hints for a, a plurality of God in the Old Testament is that someone is coming from God and the someone who is coming from God is God. Like in Isaiah 7, 14. Uh, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The Lord, like Heavenly Father. Uh, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will, um, and will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. For God, God, the Lord himself, speaks that there will be somebody else who will be God with us. Or um, even plainly, uh, you know, more clear way, uh, clear text is in Isaiah 9, 6. For um, to us a child is born, to us a sign is given, and the government will be on his shoulder. This uh, child, which was described already in Isaiah 7, 14, now has different titles. Beautiful, like Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Um, therefore, he is Mighty God. For someone coming from God, and uh, it's still God. For here we have indications, hints, uh, for uh, two divine persons. Or we have plenty of uh, biblical passages which uh, refers to the angel of the Lord. And I will not go through all of this. You can see in my article, you can go through the details. Um, and this... Um, are really pointing that someone, uh, you know, is coming here like the angel of the Lord, and this angel of the Lord can be uh, identified as God, and still he is a different one than God, um, what we will call like uh, the Father um, who is uh, present in heaven. Here is the angel of the Lord. Like, uh, you know, the phrase, Malach um, Adonai, the, the, the angel of, uh, or messenger of the Lord, is used for the first time in the story about Hagar and Ishmael. Uh, Hagar recognizes that this angel of the Lord is God, the living one who speaks to her in verse 13, in, according to Genesis 16, and there are some more details. Or you have uh, an excellent, you know, extraordinary story in Genesis 22, where the angel of the Lord speaks to Abraham, uh, when he's um, sacrificing Isaac and he's identified this angel of the Lord as the Lord. Uh, this passage in Genesis 22 is very strong. Um, the angel of God plainly declares to Jacob that he is God, like according to Genesis 31, 13, I am the God of Bethel. And this is the angel of the Lord is now speaking. And this angel of the Lord is identified. He speaks about himself as the God of Bethel where you anointed a pillar and where you made a vow to me. Twenty years earlier, in Bethel, the Lord appeared to Jacob in a dream, assuring him that he was not alone and blessed him. And Jacob made a vow, vow to be faithful to him, according to Genesis 28. Or fourth example, when Jacob blessed Joseph, he equated the angel with the Lord. May the God before whom my father's Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has delivered me from all harm, may he bless these boys. 
you see very clearly that here you have the God, uh, and then you have the angel. And this is uh, the um, reference to two uh, divine, you know, persons. Um, and uh, this angel is really the Lord. Uh, there, the angel of the Lord, according to Exodus 3, uh, when uh, Moses was uh, meeting uh, with God uh, in uh, the burning bush, who was in the burning bush, uh, you can read in uh, chapter 3, in verse 2, there the angel of the Lord appeared to him, to Moses, in flames of fire from within a bush. Therefore, angel was within a bush. And later on you read, when Moses came closer to investigate what was going on, the Lord God commanded him from within the bush. For now, this angel of the Lord is the Lord God. And this uh, Lord God within the bush was telling him, take off um, your sandals because uh, the place in which you are standing is the holy place. And um, you have some more indication in the text. Another place uh, is uh, Judges chapter 2, 6 and 13, where the angel of the Lord, you know, and, and God are really associated together. Uh, and uh, I think the passages are very plain. One of the greatest stories are also in Zechariah 3. The angel of the Lord passage there reveals the extraordinary position of that being. He rebukes Satan, Satan commands others to obey him, removes iniquity, orders that the new garment be put on Joshua, forgives sins, and commissions Joshua the high priest. Therefore, these actions are prerogative of God, yet the angel is distinct from God himself. And what he's doing, um, it points, um, this points to the plurality within God, uh, the two distinct uh, divine persons. All right, therefore, that was the, you know, very clear third indication for the um, different persons. And then, uh, let me, uh, you know, say it very plainly that there are biblical texts which distinguishes between two or even between three divine persons. For let me go very quickly uh, through some texts. And therefore, we will have two sets of biblical texts. One list will be with uh, two different divine persons, and then I will have the second list with three different divine persons. For let's go through that two allusions um, to two divine persons in the biblical text. The first is Genesis 19.24. Then uh, the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Therefore, if you understand that the Lord was uh, with Abraham, it would be like a pre-incarnate Jesus in this uh, theophany. He was there. And now um, the divine judgment comes. And the text is saying, yes, the Lord, like uh, Jesus, rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. It makes only sense when uh, you have these two distinct divine persons. Exodus 23, 23, my angel will go ahead of you and um, uh, bring you into the land, the, the promised land, and I will wipe them out. Or you have um, Psalm 45, speaking about God and your God. Um, then uh, Psalm 110, verse 1, which is a powerful statement that the Lord, like the Heavenly Father, says to my Lord, my is David's Lord, this Lord will be Jesus Christ. Sit at my right hand um, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. For here you have the Lord, uh, Heavenly Father, and then the Lord, David's Lord, uh, which we as Christians, we will identify with the, um, uh, uh, with the Messiah, Jesus Christ, as it is identified very plainly in the New Testament. Proverbs 8, 22 to 31 speaks, um, you know, about wisdom, which is like a hypostasization or personification of God himself. And uh, this wisdom is the co-creator uh, with the Heavenly Father. You can 
uh, see that uh, in Proverbs 8:30 30 to 31. Then I was the craftsman of his side, like uh, you know this wisdom, this uh, you know personification of, of God, like Jesus Christ, on his side. It means heavenly Father. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence, rejoicing in his whole world, and delighting in mankind. For they were, you know, rejoicing together when they were creating. Proverbs 30, verse 4, you have um, that the father-son relationship is suddenly described. Like in the New King's Version translation, at the end, when it is to present it that here is the, someone who is the creator, and suddenly you have statement, and what is his name? And what is his son's name? Tell me if you, if you know. Another indication is in Daniel 7, uh, in that uh, co heavenly court scenes, you have the ancient of the day, which is heavenly father, and then you have a son of man, which is um, a divine person, heavenly person, uh, riding uh, on the clouds of heaven, and this is uh, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Or in Hosea 1.7, you have another text, and I will show love to the house of Judah, and I will save them, not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horses or horsemen, but by the Lord their God. Therefore, I will do it by the Lord their God. Again, two divine persons. Or Zechariah 3.2, the Lord Yahweh said to Satan, the Lord Yahweh rebuke you, Satan. For you have here, Two lords, if you want to say, therefore, two divine persons, uh, but one Godhead. Zechariah 10, 12, I will strengthen them in the Lord, and in his name they will walk, declares the Lord. Therefore, the Lord speaks about uh, the Lord, two different persons. In Malachi 3, 1, again, is pointing um, uh, that the Lord... Almighty speaks and speaks about the Lord who will come to the temple, which is a reference um, to, um, about Jesus Christ who will come to the temple in Jerusalem. Well, and then is a second list of uh, three different divine persons. Like uh, first indication you have in Genesis 1, uh, um, where um, in the very beginning uh, God uh, creates um, the earth, the Spirit of God is there, and God creates by His Word. And this, according to first um, chapter of the Gospel according to John, is indicating um, of Jesus Christ, the Word. Therefore, there are these allusions even, even here. But a stronger text is Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. This um, messianic prophecy announces uh, the coming of the shoot from the stem of Jesse, having in view the Davidic king, Jesus Christ. Then it mentions also the Spirit and the Lord. And you can read that very plainly in the text. Then, um, you know, all, all these three persons are there. Or Isaiah 42, 1, here is my servant, suffering servant, uh, servant of the Lord, Jesus Christ, whom I the Heavenly Father, uphold my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit uh, on him. For you have all three persons here. Isaiah 48, uh, 16. At, at the end you have again, and now the sovereign Lord, Heavenly Father, has sent me, the suffering servant, the servant of the Lord, the Messiah, with his spirit. All three persons are alluded in that one text. Um, and the mission of the servant of the Lord is very plainly described in Isaiah 49, verse 6, that he will be salvation to the ends. He will not only proclaim salvation, but he will actually be salvation to the end of the world. And only Jesus Christ himself can be salvation. We can only proclaim salvation or announce salvation, but he is the salvation. And um, in Isaiah 53, you have uh, what this servant of the Lord will do for us to save us from our sins. And then the fifth text um, with three persons is Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2. The spirit of the servant Lord is on me. Therefore, on uh, again the servant. And because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And then the sixth text is in Isaiah 63, 
8 to 11, where you have again this very important combination. The, the Lord will speak. He will speak about the angel of his presence, which is Jesus Christ, and then about the Holy Spirit. Like, for example, here you have, and they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. And again, the, where is he who said his Holy Spirit among them? For all three persons are there presented in this passage of Isaiah 63. And the last text um, I would like to mention is in Haggai chapter 2, verse uh, 4 to 7, where you have again the Lord Almighty in the text. Then you have about uh, my spirit. And at the end, you have also the beautiful prophecy that the desire of all nations will come to the temple which will be built again under the leadership of Zerubbabel. Uh, for beautiful statements about three divine persons, the Lord Almighty, His Spirit, and the desire of all nations are projected to be together in this second temple in Jerusalem. Well, my conclusion, this uh, fresh investigation of the Old Testament Trinitarian thinking leads to a stunning conclusion. Even though the divine expressions of we do not testify directly about the Trinity, about the three persons, they hint to um, uh, multiple persons, to a unity and complexity within the being of God. This plurality within deity is all attested and developed then later in the New Testament. The biblical monotheistic belief does not think about God in terms of his solitude or his singleness, but presents him as we, or in fellowship within the Godhead. God created humanity in his image. He made humans in fellowship with each other, particularly husband and wife, in a close, intimate relationship, because his fellowship, he is in relationship within himself. This divine plural of fellowship suggests plurality of persons and points to the unity in his nature. This intra-divine fellowship of one God within plurality is a unique characteristic of our God. God is a communication. God, God is in communication within himself and with his creation. He can build a personal relationship with this. Um, we can build a personal relationship with this God of relationship and interaction. The doctrine of the Trinity is not yet fully developed in the Old Testament, but one can find impressive expressions pointing to Trinitarian thinking. We discovered that the Old Testament uses a whole plethora of terms for describing the second person of the Godhead. The biblical designation of God as we means believing in a personal, close, unselfish God of love, a God of relationship. And um, the Old Testament presents implicitly gradually and progressively evidences for the existence of the Trinity. For me, I would say this Old Testament teaching does not contradict the biblical monotheism or the Trinitarian thinking. We have discovered beautiful Old Testament glimpses or hints of the Trinitarian thinking. It demonstrates a consistent picture of the whole Bible in relationship between Old and New Testament. What is latent, hidden, like a treasure in the Old Testament, is clearly revealed or made plain in the New Testament. The New Testament is not presenting something which is entirely new or foreign to the Hebrew thinking. So, thinking about God, this is something very, very beautiful and powerful. Let us ask God for a wonder, for a glimpse to see Him and then to admire and worship Him. God is beyond our understanding. This is very plain. Instead of trying to explain the details of His Godhead, let us relate to Him personally, who is one, unique, united, unity and plurality of fellowship at the same time. And let's bow down before him and let's worship him. The fellowship with him enables us to build a true community with one another also. And as John 17 verse 3 says, this is the eternal life. That uh, we, humanity, we may know God. 
the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. And this is existential, experiential knowledge. And let's praise the Lord for his love, grace, goodness, and faithfulness toward us. And let's uh, admire him, know him better, follow him, and worship him. God bless.